Good morning. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. It's the introduction to the Arizona Employers Pension Prefunding Plan, or the AEPPP, as it's also referred to. I'm Clark Partridge with the Public Safety Personnel Retirement System. And uh, we're going to, uh, as people join us here, we'll go through a few housekeeping instructions. Um, if at any time you have any technical issues, please type your issue in the Q&A box. You'll find the Q&A box uh, there. Uh, we're utilizing the Q&A functionality uh, box, not the chat this morning. If you have questions about the webinar throughout the presentation, if you have technical issues or other types of things, feel free to type them in at any time. There will be people who are monitoring that to be able to help you with connectivity issues uh, or technical issues. Or uh, also, we will be answering some of those questions probably during the course of the presentation. But any questions that we aren't able to get to and, and cover during the presentation, we'll probably take some of those afterwards and have a discussion to the extent that time is available. This webinar is being recorded, so just remind you of that. And a copy of this uh, webinar presentation will be emailed to you uh, later on today. So with that, uh, we will get started. Uh, uh, for our speakers today, uh, of course, myself, Clark Partridge with uh, PSPRS. We also have with us Maureen Toll. She is Executive Vice President for PARS, and she is also uh, serving as the AEPPP Trust Administrator. Um, and PARS is the one that has uh, been awarded the contract to administer this for and on behalf of PSPRS. And we're grateful for them and for their experience and expertise, and we're uh, grateful to have them with us here today. We also have Charles Francis. He's a government finance consultant, and he has worked with pensions for a number of years and has a, a significant amount of expertise, particularly with Section 115 trust information. So we're very fortunate to have them with us today as we go through this presentation. So let's get started here and talk a little bit about uh, the agenda. We're going to chat about uh, PSPRS funding status and actions that we've taken uh, to address that a little bit as uh, from a PSPRS perspective. We'll talk about a Section 115 trust under the Internal Revenue Code uh, for pension prefunding, what it is, and demystify that a little bit. Uh, development of Arizona's uh, employers pension prefunding plan, what that is, and a little bit of how we went about that. But mostly we'll focus on the program overview, the providers, how it works, uh, give you some of that background information. We'll talk about the funding options, the strategies, and comparing the AEPPP to other options because you have a number of options and they're not either or. In some cases you could in, uh, adopt a number of differing and various options as part of your overall plan. We'll talk about investments and the program fees uh, and answer some questions. That's a real common area that uh, uh, for questions to be uh, involved in. And then also some implementation steps about what do you need to do to get started um, in this process. So on the next slide, let's We'll start a little bit by the pension funding status. This is a breakdown of all the different employers in PSPRS. You would see a, di a similar distribution for CORP for funding status uh, if, if you're participating in CORP. But uh, essentially 61% of the uh, uh, 61 employers fall below the 50% funded. And the, uh, those they average about 27% for those 61. 165 employers have funded status of at least 50%. So the vast majority of employers are actually funded above 50%, but we have frankly some of the largest employers that are funded below 50%. And that's what brings that overall average for 
uh, PSPRS funding levels down into that 45 uh, to uh, 50% range on average because of the weighted averaging. But you can see that a number of employers are, are uh, we expect this to move and to improve as a lot of fund employers are increasingly addressing their unfunded liabilities. Many have done so, so far and many are currently in the planning and the evaluation uh, in some point uh, trying to increase and, and have a strategy adopted and reviewing their funding levels and their objectives as to how they're going to go about that. On the next slide, these are some steps that PSPRS has taken or will be taking to give employers uh, and help them with their unfunded liabilities. Certainly we're available at any point in time to, for you to reach out and ask us questions. We can give you information. We give presentations to boards, councils uh, on what caused the situation we're in, where, what uh, the current status is, what we're doing about it, and what some options are going forward. Um, asset allocation revisions with the, with the solving of the pension uh, reform and the pension funding uh, problems and stopping to dig that hole deeper. Part of that is also taking a new look at asset allocation. And so over the last couple of years, that strategic asset allocation, which is what drives about 92% of the investment returns, that's been revisited and looked at. So we're, we had some, relative to the market, we've had some really good uh, investment years, particularly this last year. Actuarial assumption changes. Go back to the previous slide. Actuarial assumption changes are being phased in uh, as well. And particularly uh, where what we're focusing on is the, the payroll growth assumption. That's one that has been causing negative amortization and that's being phased in over the next number of years. It's dropped from three and a half percent down to 3% and uh, will be scheduled to continue to decrease a half a percent a year. And that will help eliminate that negative amortization that was occurring in some where you were seeing that unfunded liability, even though you're paying the amortization where that unfunded liability was going up. We have a closed layered amortization that's also being phased in. That started out, at, people were able to elect either a 20 or 30 year amortization at the time of uh, pension reform. And that is now down to uh, 15 years going forward and 25 years going forward, depending upon which amortization uh, period was selected. The funding policy has been updated and has continued to be addressed as to how we are trying to ultimately fund the pension policy. This goes beyond just 100% funding, is how do you deal with it once you're 100% funded going forward as well? And how can we address that and how we make sure that, that there's a path forward for employers? There's also a number of tools that have been created the modelers that many of you are familiar with, if you're not familiar with that, feel free to reach out to me and we can put, get you the modeler information. But the modelers have been created for each of the plans that you participate in. Yeah, and uh, you can use that. Again, the modeler isn't intended to be exactly precise. It is directionally correct, just like the actuarial valuations themselves. They're a snapshot in time based on a series of estimates. And the modeler builds upon that information and all of that data in your actuarial valuation and it uses certain scenarios that you can simulate in how to address your unfunded liability or if you're fully funded also how, what is the path forward and how you want to manage your pension liability going forward. Some things coming up that the, uh, we're working on at PSPRS working on creating a dashboard of funding metrics. This is being worked on with the advisory committee. And so there's a number of things that we expect somewhere around uh, maybe January of, ne of next year uh, that we're going to be able to have those funding metrics to where we can start uh, utilizing those. They may not be finalized 
uh, certainly as with any metrics that we use, we will monitor them over time, see what works best and see if there are improvements that can be made. But we'll also, I, I think, have a pretty good set of metrics that are being developed and discussed with the advisory committee uh, currently. We'll also be st stress testing, uh, 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 adopting a policy for each of the, the plans uh, during the year and look at ways that we can stress test uh, the portfolios and the assumptions and those things. We'll be uh, going in and doing a uh, experience study with the actuaries. So there's a number of things that we'll be doing there. And there's also uh, employer funding policies uh, going forward and on PSPRS website going forward and what we plan to do there. So we're continually trying to provide information, transparency, tools, and a partnership that we can really work with employers on as we go forward. So the final one on this page is the Section 115 Trust. This is just one of the strategies and one of the tools that we're trying to use to empower employers to be able to, uh, with opportunities to consider as they can go about addressing their pension liabilities. And the Section 115 Trust will be the focus of the rest of the presentation here today. The next slide. These are some options to consider as you go about addressing your funded liabilities, or if you're in a funded, fully funded status, how you're going to go about things going forward. You can make additional discretionary payments at any point in time. And some are doing that to get ahead of the curve and to fund it greater than 100%. Some, their funding objective is to be at or around 100% and, and to adapt and adjust as they go forward. You can pre-fund into a contingency reserve fund. That contingency reserve fund could be held in your own uh, local bank accounts or treasury, um, but there are some other options for that as well. Uh, you could issue pension obligation funds or certificates of participation. A number of people have been doing that as opposed to uh, funding it out of cash reserves or budgetary, budgeting for it. Uh, going into the future. You could also pre-fund uh, into a Section 115 trust. And so under the Internal Revenue Code, these uh, trusts are developed and we'll get into that detail. But all of these options can be used in combination with, with each other. Some are making uh, payments directly from, their, directly from their reserves in addition to issuing pension obligation bonds or certificates of participation in some combination. Some are creating contingency reserve funds, some are not. Some are planning to put those contingency reserve funds into a pension uh, pre-funding trust, Section 115 trust. So uh, probably with the intent of getting slightly higher returns. But those are all things that we can discuss and strategize at PSPRS, we're always a sounding board willing to discuss with you different options, give you different perspectives to think about as you make these important decisions on how you're managing your pension obligations. So we'll, on the next slide, I'll start out by talking a little bit about the law. The law was enacted. It went into place, frankly, just over a year ago in August of 2020 that allowed us to create the Arizona Employers Pension Prefunding Plan. And so once that law went into effect, we created an RFP process. Uh, it was released in January um, and it, we made a contract award to PARS on June 23rd of 21. And we met with them and the AEPPP was formally launched in July of 2021. And a little bit about this uh, and talking about this, we'll turn the time over to Maureen and she'll talk a little bit about how this works and how uh, the uh, PARS has a lot of experience with this that she can speak to and how this affects you as a PSPRS member employer. Maureen. Thank you, Clark. So before I get into the new trust program, uh, that's the focus of this webinar, 
I wanted to talk about what exactly a Section 115 trust is. And on this slide, I cite what the language is from Section 115 of the Internal Revenue Code section. Uh, so gross income for taxation does not include um, income derived from the exercise of an essential government function accruing to a state or any political subdivision. So in essence, what a Section 115 trust is a governmental trust um, that's free from taxation. And I'll explain why that's important. Um, and so funds placed into a Section 115 trust set up by a local government are have to be irrevocably committed to a central government function, which is specified in whatever the trust agreement is. Um, and so the IRS has deemed in recent years through private letter rulings that post-employment benefits such as retiree health care or pension are essential government functions. And so Section 115 trusts can be set up for them. Um, and why is this important? You know, uh, local governments are not taxed, but as you know, employee benefits, employees and retirees are taxed, their investment earnings can be taxed. So the IRS requires that any funding of employee benefits be put in a proper IRS um, vehicle. And, and so, um, and that, that protects, um, you know, the city, the, the county, the um, fire district, um, to make sure that those earnings are, are tax qualified investment earnings and it doesn't adversely affect uh, them or the, or the employees, retirees and beneficiaries of the trust. Uh, and so you've got, for example, 457 or 401ks or 401as, which is a pension plan. So the, this section 115 is set up for this pur purpose. You go, so what is a section 115 trust for pension prefunding specifically. Well, the IRS, as it's approved in recent years, these trusts um, says that it's gotta be irrevocable. So the assets have to be, can only be accessed for pension costs uh, and uh, only for defined benefit plans, which are pension plans. So assets can be set aside for state or individual pension or regional pension systems. And um, they are administered for the exclusive benefits of the employees, retirees, and beneficiaries of the trust. So they're protected in that way. The trustee custodian has to make sure that they're, that, that um, it's in the interests of those that are eventual beneficiary uh, of the trust. Um, and under, uh, under Arizona law, uh, assets can be diversified. So that's a key thing we'll talk about here. So you can invest it in ways that you can't with a regular budget account. Um, and the IRS approved this concept of a pension prefunding trust with um, PARS uh, submitted a multiple employer trust uh, approvals uh, with US Bank for a private letter rolling. So since that time, um, well over 300 public agencies in various states in the West and some in the Midwest have been using this um, concept. So um, there, there's a track record with these trusts at this point. And if you go, yeah. So, uh, options for funding the, the trust, as we described, graphically depicted here before this legislation was passed, before PSPRS sponsored this trust, uh, they, you could send funds from the general fund into PSPRS. Um, and now there's another approach or tools, Clark has mentioned, where you can send funds from the general fund into your trust account, and then uh, you can forward on to PSPRS. Uh, with your local control and flexibility. So what is the AEPPP Section 115 Trust? What are some of the features of that? Well, it's locally controlled and owned by the participating employer. So it operates separate and apart from PSPRS. Uh, so once funds go into the trust, distributions can only be made to PSPRS. Uh, they cannot be reimbursed. For, uh, so uh, uh, the local government cannot ask for a reimbursement for their their um, pension costs from it. Um, so any employer participating in PSPRS, PSPRS can invest in, in this trust program. And employers maintain flexibility and control over the investments, the contributions, the disbursements, the amounts, the frequencies. There's no, there's no minimums uh, uh, or maximums and such, and, and no controls over timing. So uh, and really important part of this is the investment providers and the options are different than PSPRS and it's intentionally um, set up that way for 
local autonomy and control and flexibility. And we'll talk a little bit about the investment providers and options uh, later in this webinar. Uh, some other features that are important to know about the trust structure that uh, as approved by the IRS, this is a multiple employer trust structure whereby there's individual sub trust set up and maintained by each employer. Um, so it has a master plan and trust documents that are ready to go um, and, and set up already and approved. Uh, the employer can contributions provide benefits only for the employees of that employer and there's no sharing of investment earnings or losses and risk. Um, the, so a governing board would adopt a resolution or an ordinance to joining the program and the trust to participate. Uh, there's no setup cost, so there's limited work in, in doing that because um, they're ready to go. Documents that have been uh, Arizona approved for Arizona law as well as IRS approved. And once those are executed by the governing board, then the trust account can be set up and contributions can be made at any time after that. So it's a fairly simple process uh, once a decision is made by, uh, by your governing board to approve, approve the trust program. So I'm gonna let Charlie uh, Francis talk about how would you use this trust now that you have a basic understanding of what the trust is. Charlie? Hey, thank you, Maureen, and thank you, Clark. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, I'm a retired city finance director and the city I retired from in 2015 was the first city in the nation to establish a section 115 trust for pension pre-funding purposes. And, and here's why, uh, you know, as a finance director, not only do you have to balance the budget, not only do you have to prepare your annual comprehensive financial report, but long-term financial forecasting and long-term financial planning is paramount in making sure that your city is, or your county is resilient and sustainable in the future. How do you do that when there's so much volatility in one of your cost elements? And so my, my thinking was, I need to remove that volatility. I need to plan today for tomorrow's pension realities. And so uh, the number one reason for establishing a Section 115 trust fund or why I use the Arizona Employers Prefunding Pension Program is to stabilize pension costs, to put aside money today for future cost volatility and increases uh, whenever actuarial assumptions uh, and real returns, when real returns underperform the actuarial assumptions. Um, so, you know, I had the choice then, well, if I'm going to set aside some money, where do I put it? I can put it into an internal services fund. I could put it into a general fund reserve policy. Uh, but uh, my city council wanted to have uh, diversified investment and they wanted to have more local control. So, uh, you know, we, we kind of said, well, rather than a reserve account, let's put it into a section 115 trust and let's be conservative about our approach. One of the worst things you can do is put money aside and then have it, you know, market negative market returns. So um, we, we chose a, a conservative uh, policy for investing that money. So number one, give me the tool tool in a toolkit. Number two, uh, you know, give me the ability to adopt investment policy that's consistent with the employers and uh, with the uh, elected officials. And then finally, you know, the local flexibility and control. So important for my city council that they make the decisions on how the investment portfolio, uh, the additional discretionary payments were made rather than a third party like the pension system itself. So um, if we move to the next slide, but I also was able to improve my credit rating. You know, so I, I'm very aggressive in working with Standard and Poor's and uh, Moody's and the other rating agencies and looking at the criteria and highlighting how the pension reform uh, efforts that we were making, you know, how they appeared on the balance sheet, how they appeared in the notes to the financial statement, um, you know, Agencies look very favorably upon uh, financial managers that you know are working to improve their pension liabilities, and um, and of course the existing city council wanted to protect any monies put aside from future city councils. In other words, once the money is in the Section 115 trust, it can only be used for uh, pension purposes, and so um, that was very very important to uh, our city when we adopted this program, and. Finally, the new strategy that's coming out is to use it with a bond funded strategy. Uh, this city of Tucson 
decided that they wanted to uh, manage their arbitrage uh, and rather than if, go to the next slide, please. So they issued their pension obligation bonds and they put the money into a section 115 trust before they begin sending it to uh, the PSPRS system. And the, and the purpose is, is that they've issued, they've traded soft debt for hard debt. They've issued like 3% or less pension obligation bond certificates of participation. They put it in the trust, adopting a, an investment strategy that allows them to manage the arbitrage they make and then send the earnings over to PSPRS. Another way of using uh, Section 115 trust with a bond funded strategy is to uh, send the money into PSPRS. And then every year when you calculate the savings that you actually received from, you know, the present value savings of what was actually returned versus uh, your interest rate that you're paying on the bonds, uh, you can put that set of money, some or all of the savings into a pension trust fund. Again, preparing today for tomorrow's pension realities. Next slide, please. Uh, and so, you know, I, I just want to compare really briefly uh, the difference between an AEPP trust and just setting aside the money into a, a general fund reserve or an internal services fund or local investment pool. Um, you know, if you're, you're kind of straddled with fixed income investing only. And if, when the money's in the trust, you can be still conservative, but have a little diversified investment strategy, thereby get, gaining a greater rate of returns. Um, and by the way, uh, just an hour before this seminar, I got the statement from the city that I retired from. They brought me back to outsource financial management for a short period. Uh, and you know, we just re returned on a conservative policy, eight point, an annualized 8.25% return for just the month of August. So um, again, diversified investing, increasing, preparing today. Uh, you know, the investments uh, can be tailored for long or short-term use. And, you know, what you can tailor a strategy where, oh, we're anticipating, you know, the, um, the uh, market returns not going to meet the discount rate next year. So well, let's, let's have our investments mature early next year. Or it can be for a more longer-term period. It's irrevocable. Once it goes into the AEPPB trust, it can only be used for pension purposes. But let me point out, if you have a tough year ahead of you, rather than making your general fund annual required contribution from the general fund, you can always make your required contribution from your AEPPB trust. Uh, because it's dedicated solely for pension costs. So they can be used for pensions rather than using them from your general fund. They're protected from creditors. And, um, you know, finally, there's a corporate trustee. That trustee is, you know, mitigating any fiduciary risk that, uh, that might be involved in if you just put the money in a reserve account. So thank you, Maureen. Um, I'll turn it back to you for uh, describing the AEPPP team. Yeah, thank you, Charlie. Um, so this uh, particular slide uh, gives you more detail on the providers that uh, are, are um, under PSPRS's program of uh, providing services to local governments. Sorry about that. Uh, so to, uh, uh, to, to local governments. So PARS, uh, who is the uh, trust administrator and the consultant, um, is the conduit and coordinator of all services um, for, um, uh, you know, a, a fire district, a city, a county, a town that wants to use this, this trust program. And uh, so um, what part of our role then is to coordinate with the other service providers and with uh, reporting to PSPRS and such. Um, so we develop and manage the documents. We make sure that uh, stay uh, in compliance with state and federal. Uh, laws uh, with the IRS, as we mentioned before, uh, do the record keeping reporting to uh, to you and can do consulting and analysis and, and other work. Uh, so PARS specializes in Section 115 trusts and retirement plans and trusts only for the governmental sector. So that's our focus. We have over 2000 plans. We have uh, over 430 uh, Section 115 trusts uh, that we currently ad administer. Um, and we serve about 500,000 um, public employees um, and 
a thousand public agencies of all different types, uh, all local government. And then we have 37 years of experience. Now I mentioned uh, US Bank is the trustee custodian. So uh, if uh, they, they safeguard the assets, they're responsible for making sure that it's uh, administered um, based on the trust agreement and the documents. Um, they're the fifth largest commercial bank and the nation's largest trustee of Section 115 trust assets. So uh, they have quite a lot of experience. They can operate as a dir directed or discretionary trustee. When they're discretionary trustee, it simply means that they are uh, the local government's invest uh, directing them to, to do investment uh, of assets in addition to safeguard those. And so there's some options um, available, custom and active and passive investment options available through this program that we'll talk about. So uh, they have over $9 trillion in trust and custody assets. Many of you might have some of your assets uh, custody with them already. And then uh, Vanguard is a specially designed option for this program. Uh, you may have heard of Vanguard. They have 7.2 trillion in assets under management, one of the, the largest low cost investment managers in the country. They design some strategies and pools um, that are meant to be very low cost um, and uh, low expense ratio um, and fees decrease on an economies of scale basis, which I'll talk about to keep the fees very, very low, whether you're small or, or large uh, public agency, uh, you could benefit from that. So that's another uh, option. Um, and uh, we'll get a little bit uh, more in detail about some of the other options uh, as we go along here. So it's meant to be a turnkey approach to reduce uh, burden on, on the staff uh, of, of your public agency. Um, uh, so comprehensive trust services, uh, that includes trust administration, record keeping, ready to go documents for you, uh, trustee and custodial services, state and federal compliance, fiduciary investment advisory and management, consulting report, audit support. So it's sort of a one-stop shop for you um, to, uh, to implement uh, this trust. And on the next slide. So here's a little bit more detail about the investment options. I mentioned there, there are pre-established Vanguard options, a conservative balanced in growth. Um, and US Bank has actively managed portfolios and low cost uh, you know, index versions of the same asset allocation. So a conservative income and income, a balanced and a growth approach, which I'll, I'll talk about. Also as part of the legislation, uh, the state treasurer's office can set up uh, a pool within this trust. Uh, that's in the process of being developed. PSPRS is involved with that. Um, and so not a lot of detail yet on that um, um, and what will happen with that. Um, and going on to the next slide. So here's the Vanguard investment strategies. I mentioned uh, their custom design for this program. The idea here is to have options. This is a locally controlled trust based on your risk tolerance, your need, as Charlie mentioned, on timing, um, on uh, how you want to use it, if you want to invest differently than uh, PSPRS, if you want to invest very conservatively, you're just trying to eke out a better return than the under a half a percentage point that you might be getting right now in um, your, you know, the state treasury pool um, that you can on, on without a trust get. Um, and so, uh, so there's various options that we want to provide to you, and we can talk about that in further detail if you contact us. Um, important here to, is um, to, to note that uh, with the Vanguard options, they have to stay within these parameters. They have some discretionary um, authority within five percentage points, but basically asset allocation has to be uh, targeted to 60% fixed income for conservative, 40% equity. Um, for their portfolio. And if you note down at the bottom, every quarter, uh, you, uh, um, Vanguard projects um, going forward what, what they see um, returns will be or expected to be. So to, at over 10 years, as of June 30th, they're expecting a 3.32% return um, for that portfolio and over 30 years, 4.92%. Uh, the balanced is 40% bonds, 60% uh, equity, that is the target. Uh, expected returns for that are over 10 years, 3.86%, and over 30 years, 5.57%. And the growth 
portfolio is 75% equity, 25% bonds with a 10-year projected uh, return of, expected return, sorry, of 4.18% and 30-year 5.99%. Um, since they update these every quarter and we can provide more detailed, um, they provide simulations of the range of returns that they're expecting going forward. Um, but uh, these expected returns have um, have gotten lower um, since uh, um, there's some factors in the the bond market and the equity market that is projecting lower returns than what um, our clients have been getting um, in the last uh, five to ten years with these types of portfolios. So, yeah. so the fees, um, and I mentioned that there's economies of scale fee schedule for uh, the Vanguard portfolios. So uh, for PARS, there's an administrator fee for their record keeping compliance, administration of the program. Um, and that's based on the assets that, um, that each local government has in the trust. So it would be based on your assets. The Vanguard fees though, are based on total assets across the, the, the pools of assets in section 115 trusts. And so their fees um, have continued to drop. Um, and if, if say your city or town went to Vanguard and said, I want this fee schedule for investment advisory management, you'd have to have over a billion dollars of assets to get it on your own. So this fee schedule um, is at this point, 2.4 basis points. So it's incredibly low. So whether you put $10,000 or 10 million in, um, you, you, get that, you get that fee schedule. So it, it benefits some of those that have smaller amounts of assets that they wanna put in. Um, and so uh, I'll, I'll show you a little bit more, but it's gone down. Uh, it started five years ago at seven basis points and now at 2.4 basis points and any new assets that are going in are under one basis points um, and it can drop under a half a basis point. So it's incredibly low. And then US bank fees are also based on the total pools of assets. So I'll show you on the next slide what that looks like from a fee standpoint. Um, so, so this is this is the example of the economies of scale for those that are interested in just low cost, you know, uh, uh, seeing fees go down um, as assets grow, that type of approach. Uh, this this you can see is for those that have been in this program, their assets have dropped about sixty percent in the last five years. And if you go into the next slide, uh, so we're showing here some hypothetical contributions. Uh, 1 million, 15 million, 25 million, what it, what it would look like. This is, you know, assuming a one-time contribution and not any investment earnings or losses. Uh, but you can see that the PARS fees uh, are, are based on the contribution amount, the agency's uh, dollar amount, um, and they, they reduce as the fees go up on a graduated or blended fee schedule. The Vanguard fees stay the same because uh, they're based on, um, obviously, at any point in time, they can, they can change, but uh, but currently this is as of June 30th. And then the U.S. Bank fee schedule, actually it's lower than this, but we leave it at this because we it, it varies based on the pools. So it could be anywhere from three to four basis points. But in essence, uh, this this at, at this given time, what your uh, monthly in, um, fees would be on a dollar basis. So U.S. Bank has, uh, Four diversified options that they have available. You can see here one that Charlie mentioned that his city uh, used, his former city, uh, which was uh, uh, about 25% roughly uh, equity and 74%, 75% uh, uh, into equity. So it's a very conservative option. There's an in income option, which is kind of split between fixed income and equity, a balanced option that is uh, roughly about the uh, you know 63% equity and uh, about 35% um, in 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 fixed income type assets and and growth uh, which was similar to the Vanguard growth portfolio um, and then the really important thing to note here is um, that U.S. Bank can also customize so these particular asset allocations can be uh, actively managed under line funds or uh, or index based so they have some variety in that as well. Um, but many will choose to use uh, them for customize um, if something um, to fit their individual needs. 
and if you go on, so the, so these fees are based on uh, the assets of the local government that joins the trust. And uh, mentioned the PARS fees previously, and the U.S. bank fees here are based on uh, on on the individual agency's assets. Important to note, as I mentioned before, there's no cost to set up the trust, um, but the only costs are when you start to uh, to fund and invest it. Then there's depending on your investment approach, um, there are asset based fees. And uh, this is a hypothetical cost at the same 1 million, 15 million, 25 million, what it looks like the PARS costs and then uh, the US bank fees. Again, this is based on the public agencies, uh, individual assets within the trust. And go on to the next slide. Uh, so I, I gave you the projections on expected returns for Vanguard um, as of June 30th. This is what Vanguard portfolios, these varied portfolios have done um, over time. So uh, you can see that they've had inc fairly incredible returns, but the conservative portfolio for one year uh, as of 630, this does not include their 2.4 uh, basis points and investment advisory fee there. Um, so it's gross of fees, but uh, six, 16 percent uh, and then over three years, 9.73 percent almost 8% over five years and 7% over 10 years for the conservative portfolio. And then you can see the balance is closer to a pension type investing. Um, and that um, what, what's, um, uh, you, you can see what the portfolio has done there and growth of course uh, has had a significant year due to the equity markets. Um, and then US Bank as well. So this is the active Underlying funds are actively managed. This is the projected. There's also an index version of these same asset allocations. Uh, you can see here what, what active is done for these various portfolios. And uh, uh, Charlie's very conservative, conservative income um, strategy, uh, it did 8.72% this, this, this year um, from as of June 30th. So, uh, but you can see long-term it's been around the five or four percent for that kind of a portfolio. And uh, so finally, I just wanted to go over what the steps are to implement the trust. I mentioned it briefly, but uh, so if you were interested, then um, PARS would provide the trust documents for your review. There's also an employer agreement that uh, PSPRS has come up with that would need to be reviewed and signed as part of it. Um, and so once um, your uh, public agencies has, has reviewed it, um, then in essence, what they would do is with the governing board to formally approve the adoption of the trust and the program. Once they have done that, then signature ready <clears throat> documents are provided to be signed and executed. And the, uh, the resolution or ordinance that approved designates a plan administrator, which is a position at, um, at, um, at your entity that would sign those required documents. Once those are executed, then a trust account is set up with US Bank and contributions can be made um, at any time after that. Uh, as mentioned, there's no fees to set up and there's it, not until the assets are in the trust. But if you wanna get it set up quickly, it's usually within, um, if the documents are executed usually within 10 days, two weeks after the documents are, are executed, signed, then the trust can be set up. And so it's a fairly simple process in that regard. And so if you are interested, uh, you can contact me um, representing PARS or you can contact uh, Clark, who is the program administrator with PSPRS uh, directly and their contact information is here. So, so with that, um, I wanted to, um, uh, if you have any questions, feel free at this point to um, put them into the q and I know there was a question answered here. Will you be providing a copy of the presentation after the webinar? And yes, uh, we will. And then I believe there will be a recording that will be available on the PSPRS website as well. Um, so um, feel free to put in some Q&A questions. Um, I will, there are a few questions that we get asked a lot that I might throw out to Clark and Charlie. Um, um, so um, 
you mentioned, Charlie, this rainy day concept of this of this trust. So if I'm having um, difficulties in a budget year, maybe say, um, in, you know, in the future, um, tough economic conditions, um, how do I how do I use the trust to 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 save um, from general fund costs? No, oh, thank you, Maureen. Yeah, the uh... Yeah, the, the trust can always be used to send uh, payments into uh, PSPRS. And so if you are having a difficult general fund year, uh, you could just not make your payments out of your general fund, or you could link your payroll accounts to the PSPRS trust rather than to your uh, general fund checking account, and the payments can be made that way. You know, in addition, Maureen, uh, some other uh, people actually take a portion of their reserve, their general fund reserve, and also put that into the Section 115 trust. In other words, they say, next year's PSPRS uh, amortization payment, I'm gonna put it into the trust this year and earn that little bit extra income on it and then make that amortization payment uh, the following year. So there's multiple ways of, of using the trust to enhance your earnings uh, as well as safeguard your assets and be preparing today for tomorrow's pension realities. So the concept of rate stabilization. <clears throat> um, so if your rates are going up in a year, you could just take the difference between what the rates were the year before and uh, in the increase and take funds out of that and set the difference and send that on um, as well. So you could take partly from the general fund and partly from the trust. Is that correct? Oh, yes, that's correct. You can do both. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then how uh, how would assets in this trust be reflected on, fin on the financial statements of my public agency? Oh, I get that question a lot. Thank you, Maureen. The, um, but first of all, the it's a, gen it's a restricted asset. So on your statement of net assets, it would be in your governmental funds as a restricted asset and, of course, a restricted uh, uh, net asset. Uh, and But in the notes to the financial statements, here's where you can get creative. Um, you can actually uh, uh, designate what your net pension liability is coming from the statement of net assets and then say, but offsetting this is the amounts in the Section 115 trust fund, thereby reducing our net pension liability uh, by X amount of dollars. Uh, on your governmental statements, some entities choose to put it into their governmental, uh, their general fund as a uh, general fund reserve, uh, or the, some entities put it into an internal trust uh, fund. Uh, so uh, lots of flexibility on how to present this on your financial statements. But at the end of the day, it's on your financial statements. So you therefore can feel confident presenting it to um, you know, rating agencies saying that here's the pension reform we undertook and here's how it affects our statement of net balance, uh, assets and here's how it affects our balance sheets and, and here's where it is in their notes to the financial statement. Um, here's a difficult question that uh, maybe Clark might need to answer, Charlie. Um, how does PSPRS actuary or how might they treat um, assets that are in this trust that are eventually going to be going on to um, the system for um, um, well, the dollars in the in this trust are in a separate trust, so um, PSPRS trust cannot consider them as part of uh, that uh, obligation. But as Charlie mentioned, this is part of an overall strategy. If somebody wants to put the monies into the PSPRS trust then those assets will be earning interest. They can be invested with PSPRS doing things that way. But certainly, as Charlie had pointed out, when you get, if you have money in a Section 115 trust, that is, are re, they are irrevocable. They're restricted for pen, use for pensions, specifically for uh, PSPRS, Corp, or EORP. Some only participate in, in PSPRS, but others participate in multiple of those programs. So when you look at those types of things, you can make sure in your financial statements presented in such a way that the users and the, of the financial information can see what your overall pension liability is 
but also what assets are set aside for that pension liability. So you really have some flexibility in how you present that in using this as a tool. Of course, you can also transfer the assets directly to PSPRS, and then they can clearly be uh, taken into account in both the uh, contributions and the pension liabilities going forward. Um, do you do you need to have a policy, a pension funding policy for this trust, or can you uh, can you not have a written policy? What what would you suggest, or what what is required? Well, as, as part of pension reform, any uh, there is a requirement for every employer to review their actuarial valuation and formally adopt that actuarial valuation. If there is an unfunded liability, they're also required to have a funding objective as to how to address that and to post that on their website. So for example, an employer could have a funding objective of, let's say that they're 75% funded at this current point in time. They have a funding objective to slowly increase that funding uh, 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 percentage up to 100% uh, over a five-year period of time. And they come up with a plan on how much they're going to contribute to PSPRS. As they do that, they could, for example, put all of that money into a Section 115 trust and then release it to PSPRS per year. They could also have a combination of they're going to do both. They could release part of the money into PSPRS and put part of it into a Section 115 trust. So there's a lot of flexibility, a lot of options that we could chat with employers about, depending upon what their funding objectives are and what they're trying to accomplish in the management of their pension obligations. Great. Charlie, what kinds of services can uh, PARS provide as the trust administrator, but also the consultant related to a, a, a plan and policy if, if needed for how to use the trust? Oh, well, that's one of the wonderful things about PARS is the consulting services. Um, we're, we're there from the beginning to the end. Uh, if, if you decide you want to move forward with just having a financial tool in your toolkit, we'll walk you through the process of how to, how to set up and have a Section 115 trust ready to fund. Uh, we're also available to make uh, presentations to the city council uh, to accompany your staff report. Uh, we have staff reports from all 240 of uh, customers that have already set up Section uh, 115 trust funds for pension purposes. So we can give you examples of the staff reports uh, and actually help you write them, make presentations to the city council. Uh, help your city, some city councils want to adopt a formal investment policy. In other words, directing the city manager to only use the Vanguard Index Fund or to only use the U.S. Bank Conservative Income Fund or you know, whatever policy they, they choose. Um, so we can work with you on that. And then we can also help um, model different scenarios, uh, how much to put in, when to take it out, uh, you know, how to stabilize uh, your costs and, and actually then um, write that policy that Clark just referred to, the annual funding policy, uh, we have a funding policy matrix that talks about the, the funding goal, the, the time frame you wanna reach that goal, the tools that you have available, the impact on your uh, general fund and service levels uh, and the financial impact. So um, uh, a whole, the whole range of consulting services go along with this, as well as quarterly meetings on the portfolio performance uh, you know, and revising and revisiting the strategies that you put in place. Thank you, Maureen. Yeah, yeah. One comment on that: that how often you want us to re to review, or the investment review can be once a year at a minimum, but sometimes it's more often than that. Some don't want to do it four times a year, um, so it, it it's really fits your, your needs in terms of how often we do the reviews. But there's monthly statements and. Uh, uh, as well as quarterly reports sent to you. Uh, either way, so there's a lot of information that uh, that you receive as part of the trust program. If there are, aren't any other questions, I'll just wait a couple more minutes. Um, uh, we'll uh, we'll bring this webinar to a close.
and uh, we'll send out to you or make available to you uh, the actual presentation and uh, let you know about how you can listen to a recording of this. And as again, we'd, we'd be happy to talk to you in further detail. As Charlie mentioned, we have a whole library of staff reports about how this is presented and how it's used because it is a kind of a, a flexible tool. Uh, we learn all the time from our public agencies um, how they think about approaching the use of this trust. And so it, it is definitely individualized to their needs. With that, thank you for uh, attending and have a good rest of your day.